Can a financial advisor actually increase your investment returns by 3%? That's the question we're going to answer today. Hey everybody, this is the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. And a number of folks, both in comments to videos and in emails to me, I'll read you one in a minute, has asked me this very question. And the reason it comes up is because Vanguard put out a paper saying that they quantified the value that a financial advisor brings to your investment portfolio, and it's a whopping 3%. And advisor, advisors are actually using this paper to say, hey, hire me. And by the way, if you're, if you're paying 1%, you're getting a good deal because I'm going to increase your returns by 3%. So we're going to take a deep dive into Vanguard's paper and to see if there's any like, you know, reality to it. So here's the question I got from a viewer named Paul, uh, and he's talking with his advisor. And he said that his advisor did contradict me. Can you believe that? Uh, it's saying that all the data, not just some of it, all the data uh, shows a good advisor can add value to your portfolio. He said that Vanguard, and then Paul went on to say, I looked this up and they did state this, said that overall advisors produce an average of another 3% of value for their clients. Well, we're going to take a deep dive into that and see, you know, just where the truth lies. So let me show you the paper. I'm going to pull it up now. And here it is. This is the Vanguard paper, putting a value on your value, quantifying Vanguard uh, advisors alpha. And you think about alpha is just some extra return over and above what the market would produce. And sure enough, we come down just to the summary here. There's the 3% right there. I don't know how well you can see it, but Vanguard says, we believe implementing the Vanguard Advisors Alpha Framework can add about 3% in net returns for your clients. All right, so we need to take a deep dive. How in the world did Vanguard come up with this? And more importantly, does it apply to your specific circumstances? So I will leave a link to this 28 page paper below the video, but no, you don't have to read it. We're gonna walk through it. And here's actually the key part. Here is where they actually go through different um, things that your advisor can do for you. And then they quantify, these are basis points. So 34 basis points would be 0.34 of 1%. And when you add them all up, uh, you get to 3%. So let's walk through them. The first is a suitable asset allocation. Well, we talk about that here all the time. A three fund portfolio would be a suitable asset allocation, at least for long-term investors. Of course, uh, it would be important to determine what percentages you put in each fund, but we've talked about ways to figure that out. That's not hard to do. Notice they give it a zero, and if you look at these little asterisks, and the point is not that this doesn't have any value, it's just that it's they, they couldn't quantify it. But uh, if you're investing on your own, um, you know you should have a, a good diversified uh, asset allocation that generally favors equities. We've talked about it many times. Not at all hard to do. All right. The next one, worth 34 basis points, is basically using inexpensive index funds. They call it cost-effective implementation and then in the parentheses expense ratios, but that's what they mean. Well, if you follow this channel and if you invest like I do, we're already doing this. I don't need to hire an advisor to put my money in an index fund. I can do that myself, thank you very much. Uh, here's the other thing, interesting thing. A lot of advisors don't actually do this. I can't tell you how many portfolios you all have sent me showing me all of the investments. Sometimes it's 20 or 30 investments for a relatively small portfolio and you're paying 1% or more in expense ratios. So yes, I think index fund investing is the way to go. We can do it on our own if we want to. We don't need an advisor uh, to do that for us if we don't want one. And frankly, a lot of advisors don't follow this framework. All right, let's go to the next one. Rebalancing. Now this is interesting. Uh, they give it 26 basis points. And if you go and, and read the details in this paper, what they say is that rebalancing actually lowers your returns. And that's true because more often than not stocks go up, you rebalance by selling stocks, buying bonds to get back to your stock to bond allocation. The reason you do that is not to goose your returns, but rather to keep the same risk profile of your portfolio. So then you say, well, if rebalancing can actually lower your returns, how do they come up with this 26? Well, again, if you read the details, they had to do some fancy footwork to come up with that number. What they said was, yeah, we can't just compare it to not rebalancing because not rebalancing will actually end up with higher returns. 
So we have to compare this to a different portfolio. They picked 80-20 and came up with 26 basis points. Frankly, uh, I think that's a bunch of hooey. And yes, that's kind of a technical term, but not really. Uh, at the same time, how hard is rebalancing? In the paper, they, they show you doing it once a year. It's easy to do, but yeah, rebalancing. All right, that's 26 basis points of this 3%, fine. The next one, and I think the most significant, is behavioral coaching. They give it a value of 150 basis points. This is really where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is the one where if you're going to sell, sell out when the market crashes, or when the market's up, you're going to sell all your bonds and put it into stocks to chase returns, then yeah, you, you need some kind of uh, financial advisor or maybe, maybe a robo-advisor, but you need something to keep you from doing that. And this, to me, if you're going to hire an advisor, this is really where they, they will really earn their fee. Now, that doesn't mean go spend 1% of assets under management. There are plenty of ways uh, to get advisors that charge a lot less than that, and I'll include a link below this video to a, a sort of a directory of low-cost advisors that I'm keeping track of. They're not recommendations. You have to do your own due diligence, but it's a list of folks that certainly charge a lot less than 1%. But this is the one part of the paper I absolutely agree with. You need some way to stick to your investment plan, and if that means hiring an advisor, then so be it. All right. The next one is asset location. They actually give this zero to 75 basis points. And the, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the, the benefit of asset location will depend in part on your tax bracket. So it's a very hard thing to just generalize. But asset location, and we've talked about this, it just means what kind of investments do you put in taxable accounts? What kind of investments do you put in sort of traditional retirement accounts? And what kind of investments do you put in Roth uh, retirement accounts and maybe HSAs? if you have them. It's not all, all that difficult. I want fixed income in traditional retirement accounts if, if, I, if I can. I want um, equity investments in HSAs and a, for the most part, equity investments in taxable accounts. Again, we're talking about index fund um, type of, of investments. So, uh, you know, the, the they're very tax efficient. I own uh, Vanguard, as it turns out. Index funds in a taxable account, they generate relatively little um, in, in, by the way, of taxable income, it's primarily just uh, the dividends uh, that these funds uh, pay. But asset location is important. It's just, it's really not all that hard to implement. And by the way, if you have an advisor, you shouldn't assume that they're getting it right. I've had some folks email me where their advisor put them in municipal bond funds in a retirement account, which is just crazy. So is it important? Yes. Is it hard to do? Not at all. So uh, that's what they included in their alpha framework. All right. The next one is spending strategy. And again, it's zero to 110 because there's just so many uh, variables. This, of course, applies once uh, you get into retirement. And actually, in this paper, let me just see if I can scroll down to it quickly. They actually have a nice chart about the withdrawal. And th what they mean by that is uh, what accounts you take from first. I mean, it's worth just a minute while I scroll down here and try to find this thing real quick. Um, you start, I can tell you, with your taxable accounts, well, and RMDs. In other words, anything that's going to generate taxes anyway, whether you spend it or not, should be, here we go, here's withdrawal order, and the nice chart is right here. So what they say is you should, of course, spend any required minimum distributions if you have them, if you're of that age, because they're going to get taxed anyway. And you should spend taxable flows. That's just dividends and interests uh, from your taxable investments. Because again, you're going to get taxed anyway. And then in the taxable portfolio, you know, they give uh, two different options. Uh, higher expected marginal tax brackets in the future. Start with tax deferred, then go to tax free. If you think lower expected marginal tax brackets in the, in the future, they recommend tax free and then tax deferred. Uh, but that's you know basically what we've talked about many, many times. It's really not hard to implement. It is important, and uh, so it's something to keep in mind, uh, but they, they attribute up to 75 basis points to that. Again, I get it. It's important, but again, as a do-it-yourself investor, it's not that hard to implement, and if you want help, again, you don't need to spend 1% of assets under management to get that help. All right, continuing, continuing on on our list, this one's fascinating to me. They actually give it, just like the, the, the asset allocation at the top, they give it greater than zero, 
Again, their point being, this is really important. We just don't know how to quantify it. But look what it is. Total return versus income investing. What does that mean? Well, total return says, look, I'm not, I, I'm not going to give any sort of preference to dividends and interest. What I care about is total return. And if that involves some dividends and interest, great. But I'm not going to go and search for a high dividend paying stock, for example. I want to focus on total return. And what Vanguard says is that's the way to go. If you start to focus on income, where you're focused on just purely high dividend paying stocks or some sort of high yield fixed income investment, you're going to end up worse off because it's likely that your total return will underperform. What I find so interesting about that is I can't tell you how many advisors I've interacted with or heard about who, for folks in retirement, buy into the income investing approach. And it's absolutely the, 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 a suboptimal way to approach investing, even in retirement. So is, is total return investing the best approach? In my opinion, yes. It's very easy to do, by the way. A simple three fund portfolio is a total return approach uh, to investing. Not at all hard to implement, uh, but again, a lot of advisors actually drink the Kool-Aid and go for the high dividend and high yield fixed income. And I think in the end, hurt their clients, at least in my opinion. So I think the paper is fine for what it is. Uh, the reasons that they say uh, an advisor can benefit their clients is very easy to implement as a do-it-yourself investor, number one. Number two, a lot of advisors don't follow most or many of uh, the elements in this framework. But number three, if you do want an advisor to help you with these things, particularly the behavioral part of it, there's simply no reason to pay 1% of assets under management. You can get it for a lot less. So there you go. That's my take on this Vanguard paper. Happy to hear your, your questions, your comments. Feel free to disagree with me. Hopefully you'll be polite and kind in the comments, but uh, feel free to disagree with me. Would love to hear your views on this. And again, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to help you out any way I can. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.